In our broadcast today in the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to be studying the 24th chapter. Now, it is a uh, controversial chapter. There's some think that the 24th chapter of Matthew has already been fulfilled. In fact, that it's history. Two days before Passover, the Lord Jesus is in the city of Jerusalem. And as a good prosecuting attorney, as God always does, he gives a warning before he brings a judgment. He's going to bring a judgment on the city of Jerusalem and indeed the nation of Israel. And he's giving them adequate warning. Part of his, his, uh, his uh, persecution, not persecution, but prosecution is seven woes. We've already looked at a lot of them. One we're going to look at today, start out, is verse 37, and I'm reading. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. Stop right there. A couple days before Passover, the nation Israel would always very carefully, meticulously uh, paint the tombstones outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. There, after all, we're going to be um, a million people come into the city to worship the Lord Passover day, and uh, it would be contrary to the law if somebody brushed against one of those tombstones, they would need to be ceremonially cleansed. And so Israel would whitewash all the tombstones. And Jesus uses this as an analogy to explain to his listeners and indeed to the people he's talking to and bringing this prosecution against exactly what they're like. You, Jesus said, scribes and Pharisees, the ones that hated him with a passion, are like whitewashed tombs. Listen to them. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You're like a a tomb that looks beautiful, the tombstone looks great, but they don't see what's five feet below the ground, the coffin. And what God sees is not what just looks beautiful on the outside, but he sees five feet below the ground, a coffin with rotting flesh in it. And this is what Jesus is describing. The, the Pharisees are like whitewashed tombs. They look good to men outwardly, but God knows their wicked Heart. They are plotting the death of the Lord Jesus all the while. Listen to him as he continues. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, because you build the tombs of the prophets, this is verse 29, and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Now, they also had a habit of of taking the, uh, the, the tombstones and the mausoleums of the uh, prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, building these big edifices around them, making them a beautiful, beautiful monument to these, uh, to these Old Testament prophets. And they were saying all the while, you know, our fathers, they really messed up. If we had been back in those days, we would never have picked up a stone and stoned these righteous men. Look how we're adorning their monuments. Listen to what Jesus says to them. If we lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourself. This is verse 31. That you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Listen to this. Serpents, brood of vipers, how will you escape the condemnation of hell? They said that they wouldn't murder the prophets all the while they're plotting the death of Jesus, the one who the prophets talked about, who is coming, the righteous one. Wow. Indeed, hip hip hypocrites, in every sense of the word. Listen to this now. How will you escape the condemnation of hell? Strongest language in the word of God was to God's 
enemies who were plotting his death. He didn't mince words with this crowd at all, did he? How are you going to escape the condemnation of hell? You'd be astounded how many people would contradict that verse and say, well, they after all are Orthodox Jews and they may be very sincere. I always have to laugh at when uh, preachers get on television. It's always <laughs> generally a big mistake right off the bat. I'm thinking of an interview I listened to a number of years back with Larry King Live. He always had a great uh, interest in Christianity, in Jesus in particular. And the question is always the same, basically. And here it is. You, I'm sure you've heard it. If you haven't, you will. Well now, preacher, what do you think is going to happen to really sincere, orthodox, observant Jews? What about the nation Israel? They don't believe in the New Testament after all, and they don't believe you have to be born again. Is God going to send them to hell? That's the question. And now the preacher is confronted with whether he is going to compromise the word of God or not. Joel Olstein said, well, I can't, and I don't want to be the judge of that whatsoever. And others will say, well, if they're truly sincere, maybe there'll be a little wiggle room there. Why don't they just refer these questions to the answer that Jesus gave? That's the only answer that the Word of God teaches. How shall you escape the condemnation of hell? That's the answer. They had rejected him. And friends, when you turn your back on God's only way of salvation, you have signed your own death warrant. Jesus signed his death warrant. When he told them that they were a brood of vipers on their way to hell, he did it in righteousness and love towards them, hoping that some way, somehow, they would still change their mind. Oh, they didn't, but he was hoping that they would. He signed his own death warrant. Listen to this now. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now the Lord Jesus says, listen, <laughs> how are you going to escape the condemnation of hell? Notice something. I'm going to send you prophets, scribes, and wise men. They must have raised their eyebrows when they said that because there's only one person that sends prophets to the nation of Israel. The prophet was a man who had a message from God. Yet Jesus said, I'm going to send you prophets and scribes and wise men. Another proof, of course, of his deity. And then he says, you're going to murder them the same way you did me. But you know what? All the blood that was shed on the earth by righteous men, all the way back from Abel, all the way yonder to Zacharias, one of the last prophets, it's all going to fall on your head. The righteous blood of Abel to Zechariah going to fall on your head. There's a judgment coming, and God's anger has been building over the ages, over the centuries, and it's all going to fall in 70 A.D. on the nation Israel. I've always found it interesting that he chose these two names, Abel. Abel was the first man that was ever murdered. He's a picture of Jesus, according to the little epistle of 1 John. Righteous Abel. Why was he a picture of Jesus? Because his brother who murdered him was jealous of him. Abel came to God the right way, and as you know the story, Cain brought his good works. Jesus, preferred by the Lord, walked with the Lord, did the will of God. And the nation Israel, very Cain-like in their behavior, trusting in their good works and mitzvahs to get them to heaven. And they rose up against their brother, Jesus, because of envy, and murdered him. And so Abel was the first martyr, murdered by Cain. And what happened to Cain? The Bible says he became a wanderer throughout the earth. That was his judgment from God. And what happened to the nation Israel after the Lord Jesus was murdered? They became the wandering Jew that wandered from nation to nation and have been doing so for 2,000 years. Years. Not by mistake that he chose Abel as a 
picture of somebody who was murdered, who was righteous. And also Zechariah. Isn't it interesting? He chose the prophet Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah was the one that prophesied that Jesus would be murdered and betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. O nation of Israel, he says, I'm reading, quoting from Zechariah, this is the price that you priced me, the Son of God, for 30 pieces of silver. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. And so he chose these two men as examples. And he says, you murdered him, Zechariah, between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Indeed, it did, did it not. And now we see this almost like a, a plaintive wail. Listen to Jesus. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. He is almost, he's almost saying it in a, a weeping, sobbing way. He's saying, Jerusalem, I wanted to gather you together just like a, a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, a place of safety and, and comfort and, and solace. But no, you wanted nothing to do with me whatsoever. Listen to this, listen to this verse. This is remarkable. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. But I say to you, you shall see me again. You shall not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now he makes two proclamations. Number one, your house is is left unto you desolate. What's he talking about? He's talking about that magnificent temple, Herod's temple in the city of Jerusalem. He had walked out of it. He's leaving for the Mount of Olives, and he's looking back on it. He says, that house is going to be desolate. And by the way, this was all done in the hearing of his own disciples who were thinking, oh boy, we've got a problem. We thought that was going to be our headquarters, the temple. They imagined Jesus was going to walk in a couple of days hence and set up his kingdom, and there, after all, his cabinet in Jerusalem, but not just in Jerusalem, sitting in that wonderful, beautiful temple. But now Jesus is making a prediction that temple is going to be utterly destroyed, utterly destroyed, and furthermore, the nation Israel is not going to see Jesus again until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They didn't say that the first time, did they? They hated him. They didn't want him in Jerusalem. They rejected him. But someday he's going to come back, and when he comes back, they're going to be desiring his presence because he's going to deliver them with a great deliverance, their enemies. I'm talking about Israel. And that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful second coming of the Lord Jesus. So he makes this proclamation. This house is going to be left to you desolate. Chapter 24. Here we go. This is a remarkable chapter. At least I hope you find it to be so. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? As surely I say to you, not one stone should be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now the disciples are thinking, Lord, look at how beautiful this place is. Surely you don't really, maybe this is an allegory or a parable. Surely this building isn't going to be destroyed. And they ask him, is this building going to be destroyed? And his answer is, every stone of that building Every stone will be torn down. A remarkable prophecy indeed. Some of those stones were 24 feet long. Can you even imagine a stone that big? 24, I didn't say inches, I said feet. Huge. And Jesus is making a prediction that not one stone will be left on top of another stone. Now, friends, you could visit the Middle East and all around the Roman Empire, and you find all kinds of edifices and buildings. Look at the Colosseum in Rome, 
aqueducts all over the Roman world, amphitheater, or everything, buildings all over the place. Some of them are half destroyed, some are in pretty good shape, even in Greece. But not the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus is making an absolute hardcore prediction. Not one stone will be left upon another, period. How can these things be? When Titus surrounded the city in 69 AD, besieged it, his girlfriend said to him, now, listen, that temple is going to make a great summer home. I hope you're not going to tear it down. And he promised her that he wouldn't. But what happened was on the 9th of Ab, when the wall was breached, these zealots went running down to the temple as a last hiding out place to defend the city of Jerusalem, the temple. The soldiers were absolutely enraged, absolutely enraged. And he went running in there, and the battle was so fierce that somebody threw a firebrand into the temple, and it caught on fire, and it burned the place down. It burned all the wood in the building, but did you know that the temple inside, particularly the Holy of Holies, was loaded with gold? <laughs> the ceiling, the walls, the floor was covered with gold, and the fire melted the gold, and it fell down into the cracks of these rocks. And he began to actually remove every rock from every other rock to try to retrieve the gold. You want to go and see the temple today, you can go and see it. It's in the Kidron Valley. Every boulder, every rock rolled down into the Kidron Valley. It was flat by the time Rome was done, exactly as Jesus had predicted. And may I suggest to you, if one stone had been left on top of another stone, he could not have been the Messiah because he would have made a false prediction. Stones, Kidron Valley, history. Listen to him. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When is it going to happen, Jesus? And by the way, two questions here. Also, are there going to be any signs? And surely there are. And what are they going to be? Before the end of the age. Now we get into controversial prophecy. And I think it's wonderful, quite frankly, because I think the word of God is very clear. And I don't think that we should be confused about anything. But a lot of folks, they're confused. Trust me. Drop on down to the 29th verse of the same chapter. And I'll show you why there's confusion about this. Listen to this. And I'm reading. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, now notice, immediately after the tribulation of those days, seven years of tribulation. This is Daniel's 70th week. God predicts exactly seven years of hell on this earth before Jesus literally comes back to this planet. Here's the prediction. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a great trumpet, and will gather together his elect from all four winds, even from one end of heaven to the other. Stop right there. He will gather together his elect from one end of heaven to the other. And somebody is going to say, surely that is the gathering of the church, the rapture. And it says here, Jack, that it happens after the tribulation of those days. Here is why we have a difficulty with this particular 24th chapter. May I suggest to you that there are multitudes of Christians that think the 24th chapter of Matthew has been literally already fulfilled. They think the second coming get this now, was in 70 AD when God came in power and judgment to judge the city. They think that was the second coming. And they use this particular verse here to back up their point. Now that is called an A-mill belief. An A-mill belief is, the word A means no, mill means no millennium. No millennium. Now friends, we get that belief because the Catholic Church including the reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, 
when they came out of the Catholic Church, they were fighting for justification by faith and didn't get into a lot of prophecy. The Catholic Church believed that God was completely finished with the nation of Israel, done with them, kaput. And any time that God used the word Israel in the Bible, they thought it referred to themselves, the church. They interchanged the church for Israel. How convenient. How convenient indeed, but how wrong. And to do so, they had to spiritualize the scriptures. <laughs> and where did they get the authority, by the way, to do that? Now, we're going to be showing you some very clear, distinct prophecies. It can't be spiritualized unless you want to twist the word of God to fit and conform to your bad theology. What does the word of God say? It says that when Jesus comes back, he's going to gather together his elect. But friends, they assume he's talking about the church. He's not. He's talking about elect Israel. The Lord Jesus, when he comes back to this planet, he's going to give a call and bring back all the Jewish dispersed who have been there for 2,000 years, a lot of them, bring them right on back, the Jewish people, to the land of Israel. They're going to come streaming in, according to the prophet Isaiah, weeping. The question arises, has God finished with the nation of Israel? That's the issue. If God is finished with the nation of Israel, then the 24th chapter of Matthew is a, not a prophetic book, it is a history book. And by the way, the A. Mills believe also that the book of Revelation is a history book, not prophetic in nature that all prophecy has been fulfilled. Well, let's take a look at this. Turn first, if you wouldn't mind, to Romans, the 11th chapter. Romans 11. I'm so glad that God has given us a complete chapter in the Bible to disprove what they're trying to foist on us. Now, the book of Romans is the second most important book of the Bible. Matthew is the first, Romans the second. The apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, and it spells out how we get righteous with God, what justification by faith is, what sanctification is, how we get victory over sin. And then God says to his people, the church, I don't want you to be overlooking my Jewish people. He knows we have a tendency to be pride, prideful. I don't want you to suppose, because you were saved, and I have set them aside, that somehow I am finished with them. So I am going to give you an entire chapter, because I know you're prone to forget about my Jewish people, but I'm not for going to get forget about them. Listen to Paul speaking, chapter 11. I say, then has God cast away his people? Now here is the rub. A lot of folks, including the Catholic Church, would say, yes, he has. He's done with Israel. But what does the word of God say? God forbid. I like the old King James. Mine says certainly not, but I like that one. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. Listen, God's not done with Israel, otherwise he'd be done with me too. God is not done with Israel. Now listen, go forward a little bit. Still in the 11th chapter, listen to this now. I'm reading from verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall Israel has stumbled. They rejected the Lord Jesus. But is that all there is? Is God done with them? Have they fallen down to stay down? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, listen, you were Gentile today. You got saved because Israel rejected the Messiah. If Israel not rejected the Messiah, where would the Gentile be? God wanted to show mercy on Jew and Gentile, and when the Jewish people, the nation in particular, turned their back on Messiah, God turned to another people, the Gentiles, who were hopelessly lost and dead in their trespasses and sins. Salvation came to the Gentile. Now listen now, I'm reading. Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, get the drift? How much more their fullness? Listen, 
if Gentile dogs are born into the family of God because they rejected their Messiah, how much more of a blessing is going to come to this world when the nation Israel finally turns back to their Messiah and are born into the family of God? Listen to Paul as he continues. I'm reading now from verse 28. 25, I'm sorry, and it's still in chapter 11. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Judah, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Is God done with Israel? God forbid. When Jesus comes back at the second advent, after the tribulation, he doesn't gather the church to himself because the church is already in heaven. He gathers his elect, elect Israel to himself, back to the land. That's what that verse in the 24th chapter of Matthew is talking about. But don't take my word for it. Turn with me to Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, and I'm going to share something else with you. Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, I'm not reading to you some obscure prophecies. The Word of God is replete with these predictions. Listen to this. I'm reading from chapter 30, verse 1, promise to Israel. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, this is Moses speaking, which I have set before you, and you call, on to, call to mind among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. This is quite interesting. This is 1,500 years before 70 A.D., but Moses is telling them that they're going to be spending thousands of years in Gentile countries, driven to every nation on the face of the earth. When it comes to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, <clears throat> and you return to the Lord your God, and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again <coughs> Excuse me. from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. Did you get that? Gather you from all the nations where you have been scattered. That's what the 24th chapter, the last verse, is talking about. I'm going to gather together mine elect. Listen. If any of you are driven out of the farthest part under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you from there, and he will bring you, and he will bring, bring you, then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. Bring you to your land. Listen, God made a promise to Abraham, I'm giving this land to you and your descendants forever. Friends, that's unconditional. It wasn't based upon anything that Abraham did. I'm giving it to you and your descendants forever. It wasn't based on the nation of Israel keeping the law or not keeping the law. Unconditional promise by the grace of God. God is going to fulfill his promise. Trust me, he will. God is not done with the nation of Israel. Not at all. Now, what then is the next event? I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. I want you to see something I think is very significant. 1 uh, Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. And here we go. No, let me start in actually in verse 4, 413. Here's the point. Matthew 24, Jesus says, there's going to be great difficulty come upon the nation of Israel. There's going to be wars and rumors of war. That's going to be the next verse that we look at. And all of these things, he says, it's the beginning of sorrows. And by the way, there's going to be pestilences. There's going to be disease. The world is in for a time of trouble like it's never seen before, ever. 
There are those folks that think that the church indeed is going to go through this, what we call the Great Tribulation period. But I'm going to share with you right now that that is not so. Number one, the end, when Jesus says that the, after the tribulation period, I'm going to gather together my elect, he's talking about the nation of Israel. The rapture was not even known by Jewish people during this time when Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Apostle Paul calls it a great mystery. It was revealed to Paul. They didn't anticipate any kind of a rapture. What they anticipated was Messiah coming, setting up his kingdom. And that was the question was asked. What's it going to happen before the kingdom is set up? What is going to be the signs before you're coming? And he is going to list approximately 15 different things that are going to happen before he literally comes back to this planet and sets his feet upon the Mount of Olives. But listen, the next event in God's timetable is not the tribulation period. The Apostle Paul says God has not destined out the church for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul told the Thessalonians, listen, you turn to God from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven. The blessed hope of the church today is not seven years of hell because that's what the tribulation is going to amount to. God has not told the church that you're going to go through this time of wrath because the wrath is for those who don't want Jesus and have rejected him. It is meant to bring people to their spiritual senses, so at the end, multitudes indeed will get saved. The next event on God's timetable, prophetic timetable, is this. The fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, verse 13. I'm reading. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. This Thessalonian church were losing some of their members. They were dying. Paul had told them day one, listen, Jesus is coming back. And they were going through terrible persecution. Nero didn't like them. None of the Caesars liked the Christians. They were martyred, lost their jobs, lost their positions in society. They were a outcast, a hated group of small flock. And so Paul all, always, when he preach a sermon, he would always encourage them and say, look, this isn't going to go on forever. And by the way, the same Jesus that has transformed your life and delivering you from sin, he's coming back. And the good news is it could be today. And some of the brothers and sisters were dying. And Paul says in this particular chapter, I don't want you to suppose that these brothers who have gone into the graveyard are going to miss the rapture. They're not going to miss the rapture. Listen to him now. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, that means have died. Least you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Did you get that? When Jesus comes back at the rapture, our loved ones are coming with him. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. A child of God dies, his body goes into the grave, his spirit goes to be with Jesus. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring those spirits, the real person, with him. Then what's going to happen? Well, listen to this remarkable chapter. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, verse 13, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul says, listen, this is the most wonderful news. Jesus is coming back, and if you're alive, Paul's anticipating that even he would be alive. He didn't know that Jesus wasn't going to come back in his lifetime. The ones who are alive are going to be transformed. They're going to receive their glorified eternal bodies in an instant. Paul said to the Corinthians, I'm going to show you a mystery. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. 
the rapture of the church, we're going to be caught up where? To meet the Lord in where? In the air, not in Jerusalem, in the air. The second advent when Jesus comes back to this planet. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. And the nation of Israel is going to meet him on the Mount of Olives. They're going to come streaming out of Jerusalem to embrace him. But that's for Israel, not the church. We're looking for Jesus to come in the air, and we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. First mention of this wonderful, wonderful truth is found in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus said, you know, I'm going to go away, but if I go away, I will come again. And if I come again, I'm going to, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and where I am, I'm going to come and get you where I am, you may be also. The Lord himself will descend from heaven, Jesus, the bridegroom, is coming for his bride. He didn't send Michael the archangel or Gabriel. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And he stood at Lazarus' grave and said, Lazarus, come forth. We're going to hear his voice. And those who were in the grave, their bodies, their spirits going to be reunited with those bodies. And those bodies are going to be glorified, transformed, rise out of their tomb and be caught up in clouds. It looked like clouds going up in the air to meet Jesus. That's the next event on God's prophetic timetable. We're going to stand before him. We're going to be judged at the Bema seat of Christ. We're going to receive a reward or not receive a reward. And we're going to wait for seven years as judgments fall on this planet. We're going to see these in coming broadcasts. Judgments fall on these planets. The church is going to be with him in heaven. Huh. Friends, the tribulation period is not for God's people. Again, God is not destined us for wrath. Let me give you a most wonderful verse. It's found in Revelation, third chapter, the fifth verse. Here it is. Because you've kept the word of my patience, Jesus speaking to his church, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole world to try those who dwell upon it. Did you get that? I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's coming to test all those who dwell upon it. Is there any signs preceding and that we're to look forward to before the rapture occurs? Absolutely none. How do I know? Listen to this. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning the times and seasons, they're going to ask, well, Paul, Brother Paul, is there anything that we should look for maybe that would give us just a little hint that Jesus was going to come back at the rapture? Listen to him. Now concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. In other words, he's already informed them. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes, <coughs> excuse me, as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Notice that they, pregnant woman, labor pains, when they say peace and safety, the tribulation period begins off with a very peaceful portion to it where the Antichrist brings a phony plastic peace to the world. They're going to be saying peace and safety, and then sudden destruction will fall upon them. But for us, a thief in the night. And friends, I've been robbed a number of times. <laughs> One time somebody broke into my home in the middle of the night and went into our bedroom and stole my wife's jewelry. Not that they got very much. It was mostly <laughs> fake jewelry. But they stole my wallet. I was not very happy about that. You know what it's like to get your driver's license renewed. In any event, he did it in the middle of the night, and he did it, and he was very good at it, I must admit. When I got up in the morning, I noticed one of the screens was out of the front window. I thought, what in the world is that all about? Then we noticed the stuff was stolen. He came in, and he stole, and he was on his way. I had no idea he was there whatsoever. No warning. Thieves do not send a little note and say, Oh, Jack, by the way, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to break into your house. I would have hidden my wife's plastic jewelry <laughs> and hidden my wallet. But no, no warnings. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. And there's a very good reason for that. The first time he came, he gave lots of warning. And nobody listened. He spelled out the very day he'd walk into Jerusalem, but nobody took it seriously. Even the disciples couldn't figure out 
Daniel's prophecy, although it was spelled out explicitly clear. So, God says they didn't believe me when I gave them lots of warnings the last time. This time I'm going to say nothing. Let's see what happens. <laughs> he wants us to be ready all the time. The Bible calls it a blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior who will transform our vile bodies like unto his. This is going to be most magnificent event. This is a going home of the church to meet Jesus and be with him forever. As far as the tribulation period is concerned, that's for the Gentiles, that's for the nation Israel. It's called the day of Jacob's trouble. And God help the world, God help anybody that goes into this tribulation period. Seven horrible, horrendous years like the world has never seen before. Now here's a verse for you, I'm not close in this one. To those who suppose that somehow the Gospel of Matthew in the 24th chapter is history, that indeed, if you think that 70 AD was the fulfillment of these judgments, how then do you explain this verse? Jesus says the time of trouble is going to be so severe, if the days were not cut short, no flesh would be saved. He said it's going to be a time of trouble like it never have been on the face of the earth, nor ever will be. Friends, a million people, according to Josephus, a million one hundred thousand died in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Six million Jews died during the Holocaust in the Second World War. That was much worse in 70 AD. No, the 24th chapter of Matthew is not a history chapter. It is a prophetic chapter. We need to pay very close attention to it. And we will, I hope. Well, I'm going to leave off there. We're going to continue our study in this 24th chapter, but we've got our foot in the door. I promise you we would finally get to prophetic events if we waited long enough, and we have. So listen, may the Lord bless you until next time, and thank you for joining us, and I trust that you got something out of the message. Lord bless you until next time.